Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see you all with me again today. Today is going to be something a little bit different, as this was not the book I was expecting to be reviewing this week, but I got called in on a job and unfortunately did not have the book I was reading in audiobook form yet. But I'm kind of glad this is the book that I decided to review, because it was the audiobook that would fit the time frame of the job I was called in on. Because this week we are reviewing The Color of Magic by Terry Pratchett. Normally I don't like to follow one major book series by an established author with another major book series by an established author. I like to intersperse a few indies within my other reviews. However, that's going to bring me to the first thing I'm going to ask. If you know of any independent authors who have audiobooks out there, I would appreciate leaving a link to them in the comments. One of the reasons for this is I currently work a little over 60 hours each week, and having an audiobook really helps get the whole thing done within a week's time frame or less. That way I can make a few more of these videos and stockpile them so that I actually have some time to work on my own stuff. And that's going to lead into my shameless self-promotion. If you would like to read or review any of my own works, you will find a link down in the description. Battle Games Book 1 is currently my only one that has an audiobook. I will, as soon as I get time, finish the audiobook for Hapless Homesteader, which should be out hopefully sometime in the next few months. I will leave a link down in the description to my own work. Now, let's begin with the timeline, then we'll move on to the things I liked, the things I didn't like, and my general thoughts. So we start off our book with the city of Ankhmapork on fire, and two men on a hill overlooking it as various explosions are going off, and they're lamenting the treasures and wines that are basically being destroyed and running down into the gutters. When they see a man, man is a strong word for this individual, coming with another man, which again is a strong enough, which is a very strong word for this individual, in tow with a very strange piece of luggage coming up the road. The man who is conscious is named Rincewin, and he begins to recount the story of what has happened to the two gentlemen sitting atop the hill. The whole thing starts with the unconscious gentleman, who is named Two Flower, showing up in this port city, unable to communicate with anybody. He has made himself a little phrase book where he can look up what he wants to say and then basically regurgitates every single word in that language that is even tangentially related to what he's trying to get. A local beggar, who thinks this man has lots of money and is not wrong, attempts to persuade him to allow him to help by guiding him to whatever it is he seeks. He ends up taking Two Flower to a local pub called The Broken Drum. This is a hangout for all the ne'er-do-wells and one of those places where rich out-of-towners would go to disappear and suddenly all the riffraff is buying all sorts of shiny new toys. However, by some strange coincidence, Two Flower runs into Rincewind, who, while being useless in almost every other respect of his life, has a particular gift for tongues. And after trying virtually every other language he knows, finds a particularly flowery language by a bunch of little merchants that the individual Two Flowers also happens to speak. Two Flower, it turns out, is from a place called the Counterweight Continent. And the reason for the name goes into a lot of the geography of Discworld where all this takes place. I'm not going to go into the details of it because it can be very complicated. It's fairly interesting and it is extremely weird. And it's one of those things you're going to have to pick up the book to find out about. The Counterweight Continent is a very, very rich place. And Two Flower, who doesn't realize it, is actually very, very rich rich. He's walking around with a sentient chest. Well, sentient's not quite the right word, but we'll cover it more later. Basically full of gold. In fact, it's so much gold that he hands a few people three or four pieces, which are enough to basically buy half the town. This man has about 2,000 of these in his chest. He offers Rincewind an absurd amount of money to act as his tour guide. And Rincewind, being the fine, upstanding gentleman that he is, ha ha ha, decides to basically take this man for all that he's worth before somebody else decides to kill him, rob him, and let him float down the river face down. 
However, it doesn't last long as Rincewind is quickly pulled into the local official's office, who basically tells him that this man's country is very, very vengeful, protects its citizens very, very harshly. If anything were to happen to Two Flower, up to and including his death, the retribution would be horrible, and though it would take some time for their army to sell to this little city, this official would certainly make sure that Rincewind would suffer far more, far earlier than anyone else before they were eventually annihilated. Rincewind, with his new vigor, is determined to make sure Two Flowers doesn't die, and proceeds to follow him around and act as a very official tour guide. However, Two Flower is... Let's just call him unknowingly suicidal. He wants to see bar fights. He wants to meet dangerous people. He's very excited about how rugged and quaint everything is, not realizing he's in the bad side of Detroit, with basically a giant gold chain and a big sign on his back that says, Won't someone please relieve me of all this cash in my pockets? It is just so heavy for me to carry everywhere. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the luggage, because it's very important here. The luggage is made of a substance called sentient pear wood, which makes it capable of moving under its own power, gives it a lot of strange abilities, and makes it about the most dangerous thing in the whole freaking world. It is imprinted upon two flowers and follows him everywhere he goes, and acts as a sort of carry everything he has, and kill anything that gets in his way or even remotely looks at him wrong. Two Flower going about, flaunting his cash from this giant chest, which people soon deduce is probably worth more than all the gold inside it, quickly separate him from Rincewin. And the chest, oddly enough. The chest sort of temporarily adopts Rincewin. After a quick bout of deciding whether or not he should just jump into the ocean and sail away from this place before... Two Flowers dies and the whole place is raised to the ground, is eventually convinced to go rescue Two Flower. Two Flower, it turns out, is back at the Broken Drum, as several of the less than savory occupants and frequent customers are trying to find ways to cajole him out of his money. Using this phrase book that he made or brought with him, he has told them about his job, and it turns out that he works in insurance basically calculating risk and whatnot, and sells an insurance policy to the manager of the Broken Drum for an amount of money that basically would allow him to buy the entire town. However, it is about this time, and shortly after the insurance policy is issued, that an assassin shows up to take out Two Flower. It turns out the king of Two Flower's nation is not entirely happy that one of his citizens has become dissatisfied with his lot in life, decided to go out in the world, and is potentially going to bring back a lot of seditious material that might encourage others to be dispassionate about their work. And so he's basically told him, yeah, just kill this guy, I don't want him coming back. Well, this message apparently didn't get to the local tradesmen as they all form a union called something along the lines of the Board of Tourism, and show up to stop the assassin. All of them are crowded into this very flammable bar, which is important because the bartender disappears downstairs and starts immediately breaking open casks of oil and wine, determined to commit insurance fraud to gain the money that will basically allow him to buy the entire town. Rincewind, after a uh, confrontation with a local guard, finds out where Two Flower is, shows up, throws two bags of the gold inside, and unleashes this monstrous chest, which has at this point, I believe, killed at least one person, into the room. And all the lights go out. And all the people are now aware that there is something extremely large, extremely dangerous, and virtually indestructible trapped in this pitch black room with them, and they all try to run for the door. And all of them have different memories of where the door is. And I'm going to leave the recap off there. It's actually really worth reading this story because it's remarkably funny. And I assume you can understand how the town burned down in the middle of all this chaos. So let's get into the things that I liked. First of all, and this has very little to do with the book itself, but this was a wonderful palate cleanser after Malazan. It is absolutely, completely absurd. It reminds me a lot of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'm not sure how much of a relationship Terry Pratchett has with the author of Hitchhiker's Guide. I've read both of the first books in both of those series now. They feel remarkably similar, 
though one with a fantasy setting and one with a sci-fi setting. Uh, Renswin himself seems to be more of the reluctant adventurer, and Two Flowers seems to be the oblivious, go-for-everything tourist, which makes a remarkably funny pair, but I'd say out of the two, Renswin is probably my favorite. So I want to talk a little bit about him and why I like him. Rincewind is basically a useless wizard. Sometime when he was at Unseen University, on a dare, he went into a room and looked at the grimoire of the creator and got a spell of creation stuck in his head, which basically made him incapable of memorizing any spells, or any other spells. If you're curious about how the magic system in this world works, think D&D and you're pretty darn close. Rincewind himself is fairly put upon by the universe, but he's also pretty much the source of all of his own problems. He's constantly haunted by death, and I have to think that a lot of that is because he just generally does stupid crap. He usually tries to take the easy way out, and he often does things, I would say, purely for self-serving reasons, but he does do some things for selfless reasons. He's kind of taken it upon himself to protect Two Flower, who just obliviously wanders into danger everywhere he goes, and can't seem to understand why everyone around them is terrified, and simply thinks if he can go talk to somebody, he can basically get the situation sorted out. He is the happy, nerdy tourist in a world full of everything that wants to kill him, and he just simply can't acknowledge that. Though I have to admit, throughout the entire book, he has been incredibly lucky, and I could understand why he believes himself justified in this line of thinking. To really bring home why I like Renswin, I'm going to not exactly quote, but talk about a particular part from a book. There is a part where Renswin and Two Flowers are on the road, and they get separated. For some strange reason, Renswin ends up being chased by a pack of wolves. He climbs a tree to escape the wolves, luckily, uh, commenting how he's not even sure he touched the tree he climbed so fast. Upon perching on a branch and smiling down at the wolves, he looks to the outer side of the branch and sees a giant snake coming towards him. And he immediately has the thought, I wonder if that's poisonous, to which he responds to himself, That was a dumb question. Of course it's poisonous. Just to let you know how Rince wins life tends to go. Another thing I like is that the gods are an active part of this world, and not just an active part of this world, as in they are actively antagonistic against atheists, like they'll literally strike them with lightning and go to their house and break all the windows, kind of active, which does lead a comedic edge to the gods. But the gods themselves aren't so much worshipped as blamed and grudgingly given money. You know, here's your bribe, leave me alone. They're kind of like an all-powerful mafia, but not quite as active. The next thing I really like about this is the luggage, because it's absolutely hysterical. This thing is an absolute force of nature. As I stated before, it's made of a substance called sentient pear wood, which is kind of like living wood. The chest itself can sprout dozens of legs to walk around. It apparently does have teeth and a tongue, which doesn't always show up, and it can open up various storage areas to different areas. In fact, several times in the book, it does eat people, and it is pretty much the best bodyguard on Earth because it has an instinctive understanding of where its master is. Strangely enough, not used in the first part of the book, but since this is more absurdist fantasy, I'll just let it go. I'd say the uh, the luggage itself is probably responsible for more deaths than anything else in the book. It, I think, at one point is eating an entire pirate ship, which had caught Rincewind and Two Flower and was attempting to sell them into slavery. It kind of plows through armies. It takes a hit of epic levels of magic and just continues on. It's just oblivious to all pain and basically destroys anything that gets in its way. It's probably one of the funniest things in the entire book. Also, I'd like to comment that old magic in this story is a lot like nuclear waste. They're not sure entirely what to do with it, and the disposal of grimoires and magical artifacts after the wizard has died is basically a major cause for concern. So let's get into what I didn't like. The story jumps around a lot in places and can be a little bit difficult to follow. The transitions aren't as smooth as they need to be. 
And some parts get really, really weird and seem to exist for little more than plot convenience. Now, I know this book was written to be absurd, it's weird, and this is a fairly petty niggle for something that is not meant to entirely make sense all the time anyway, but it does take a little bit away from the story, and one of the examples I'm going to cite is when Rincewind and Two Flower are basically falling from an improbable height, like they can see the entire world and they're falling towards it. Reality basically breaks because Rincewind wishes it would, and two realities collide and he ends up on an airplane stopping a terrorist, and the whole thing is... Hmm, it's not the best. I think it was more plot convenience than anything else, but it's not something that's too difficult to get over. It doesn't last too long. The explanation is a little long-winded, but soon you're into the next story and you kind of forget all about it. So now my thoughts. This is very much old-school British comedy. It often acts more as a commentary on the British culture and British language than anything else. It's odd in places. You can definitely feel the strong British influence, a lot like some of these old British shows. And it has some really weird breaks in it to comment on just obscure things. But that doesn't really take away from the fun of the story. It is odd. It can be jarring. But I found myself genuinely laughing at some of these breaks. I can definitely see why this is a popular series. The books themselves don't seem to be terribly long. They are written more for comedy than anything else. There is some definite world building here. It feels a lot like a true D&D campaign, where the characters aren't even trying to to do things the right way, they're doing everything the wrong way, and the DM is just trying to figure out a way to keep the story going and keep the characters alive because he simply doesn't have it in him to kill them. I will probably read the next book in the series and probably at some point do a full series review, probably sometime in the distant future. I'm trying to make sure I have... I want to make sure I have enough indie authors interspersed with all my other reviews of major series. Part of the reason is to compare some of the modern works with some of the older works. A lot of mainline fiction I'm not the biggest fan of, but I won't entirely discount reviewing it, and I'm trying to find the little pearls that are hidden out there and also help some fellow independent authors. But with all that being said, and for the sake of trying to keep this short so I have a few hours left in my weekend, I will wish you all good luck. Thank you for listening to my review. If you have any books that you would like to hear my take on, please leave them in the description. I do tend to favor indie authors over conventionally published, but I will read whatever I find interesting or whatever captures my fancy. If you would like to read, review, or criticize my own works, I will include a link in the description. Also, please keep the comments civil in the comments section. Also, if you enjoy what I do, please consider giving this video a like, sharing my work, or subscribing to my channel. Thank you.